are going to study a parable of Jesus that generally is misunderstood and misexplained. And that is the parable of the wheat and tares. Let us open our Bibles in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, and we read from verse 24 to verse 30. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hast it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus spoke this parable to the disciples and they did not understand the real meaning of this parable. So they approached Jesus and asked him an explanation of this parable of the wheat and tares. So Jesus gives the explanation from verse 36 to verse 39. Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 to 39. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Jesus explained now the meaning of the parable of the wheat and tares. The disciples, they wanted to understand so Jesus pointed out that there is a field and the field represents the whole world. The good seed or wheat represents the children of God. The sower that sowed the good seed represents Jesus Christ. The tares represent the wicked or Satan's children. The sower of the tares is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the harvesters are the angels. So Jesus explained the parable in clear words. 
and uh, I believe that it's not hard for us to understand this explanation of Jesus. Now this is the first application of the parable of the wheat and tares. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 100, we read the following. The day is just upon us when the righteous shall be bound like precious grain in bundles for the heavenly garner, while the wicked are like tares gathered for the fires of the last great day. But the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. In the discharge of life's duties, the righteous will to the last be brought in contact with the ungodly. The children of light are scattered among the children of darkness, that the contrast may be seen by all. Thus are the children of God to show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In this parable, or in this explanation of the parable, again it is pointed out that the righteous are the wheat and the tares are the wicked. Both are in this field, which is the world. And they grow together until the harvest. And the harvest is the end of the world. The harvesters are the angels. This is the first application of the parable of the wheat and tares. But there is still another application of the parable. In Christ Object Lessons, page 70, we read, The field, Christ said, is the world. But we must understand this as signifying the Church of Christ in the world. Now notice that here there is another field. It is no longer the whole world, but the Church is the field. Now, in this field, there are wheat and tares. In Testimonies to Ministers, page 46, we read this statement. While the Lord brings into the church those who are truly converted, Satan at the same time brings persons who are not converted into its fellowship. While Christ is sowing the good seed, Satan is sowing the tares. There are two opposing influences continually exerted on the members of the church. One influence is working for the purification of the church, and the other for the corrupting of the people of God. Again, we find here, the sower of the good seed is Jesus Christ. The sower of the tares is Satan. Both are sowing their seeds in this field, which is the church. And Christ brings into the church truly converted souls. Satan brings into the church those that are not converted. And the spirit of prophecy compares the converted ones to the wheat and the unconverted ones to the tares. And on page 71 and 72 of Christ Object Lessons, we read this. The good seed 
represents those who are born of the word of God, the truth. The tares represent a class who are the fruit or embodiment of error, of false principles. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Neither God nor his angels ever sowed a seed that would produce a tear. The tares are always sown by Satan, the enemy of God and men. Again here, the wheat are compared to people that are born of the word of God. And the tares represent a class who are the fruit or embodiment of error or false principles. The sower are all the same. Jesus sows the wheat, Satan sows the tares. Christ's servants are grieved as they see true and false believers mingled in the church. Page 71. Now notice that here the wheat are the true believers and the tares are false believers. And they are all mingled in the church. Christ Object Lessons, page 72, we read. The real character of these pretended believers is not fully manifested. Again, the tares are represented by pretended believers. On page 72 and 73, we read. The world has no right to doubt the truth of Christianity because unworthy members in the church, nor should Christians become disheartened because of these false brethren. How was it with the early church? Ananias and Sapphira joined themselves to the disciples. Simon Magus was baptized. Demas, who forsook Paul, had been counted a believer. Judas Iscariot was numbered with the apostles. Notice carefully that the tares here are compared to unworthy members. And these unworthy members existed in the church from the very beginning. Some names are mentioned here that were considered as tares. Ananias and Sapphira, Simon Magus, Demas, and Judas Iscariot. They were all considered tares. On page 73 we read, He, Christ, has said that false brethren will be found in the church till the close of time. Notice that again the tares here are the false brethren and they will be mingled in the church till the close of time. Again on page 71 and 72, we read, Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church, but he has not committed to us the work of judging character and motives. He knows our nature too well to entrust this work to us. Should we try to uproot from the church those whom we suppose to be spurious Christians, we should be sure to make 
mistakes. Here, the spirit of prophecy makes it very clear that those that persist in open sin must be separated from the church. However, characters and motives are not entrusted to us to judge. We cannot judge character and motives. On page 72, we read, Man judges from appearance, but God judges the heart. The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest, and the harvest is the end of probationary time. In this second application of the parable of the wheat and tares, things are changed. The wheat represents converted souls in the church, souls that are born of the Word of God, souls that are considered as true believers. The sower of this good seed is Jesus Christ. The field is the church. The tares represent unconverted members, pretended believers, false brethren, unworthy members, etc. The sower of the tares represents Satan, and the harvest is the end of probationary time. We notice carefully here that if the field is the church, the harvest is not the end of the world. But the harvest, the last chance for rooting out the tares, is the end of probationary time. It's interesting that in the church there may be sins which are not known. And these sins that are not known, they are tears in Testimonies to Ministers, page 428 we read. There is much we will never know, but that which is revealed makes the church responsible and guilty unless they show a determined effort to eradicate the evil. Cleanse the camp, for there is an accursed thing in it. To eradicate or to root out means the same thing. When is it that we have to root out from this field the tares? Should we leave the tares in the church until Jesus comes? No. If the field is the church, the harvest must be done when the fruit ripens. As we have read on page 71, when a member is committing open sin, he has to be separated from the church, rooted out when the fruit is ripened. But there are many things which we will never know. Tears will grow, but we do not know that they are tares. Only God knows. But that which is revealed, that which is known, if the church continues tolerating sin, then the church becomes not only responsible, but also guilty. 
unless they show a determined effort to eradicate the evil. And the last chance to eradicate evil from this field, the church, is the end of probationary time. Interestingly, today there is a harvest going on. In early writings, page 88 and 89 we read a train of cars was shown me going with the speed of lightning the angel bade me look carefully I fixed my eyes upon the train it seemed that the whole world was on board that there could be could not one be left said the angel they are binding in bundles ready to burn notice that there is a harvest going on among the wicked they are bound together in bundles to be burned in the next paragraph we read i asked the angel if there were none left he bade me look in an opposite direction, and I saw a little company traveling a narrow pathway. All seemed to be firmly united, bound together by the truth in bundles or companies, said the angel. The third angel is binding or sealing them in bundles for the heavenly garner. A harvest is going on among the wicked and also among the righteous. In ancient times, when they harvested the wheat or rice or any cereal, they bound them together in bundles and they heaped up in the field and left it there for a while until the day that that wheat was threshed and then taken to the garner. The same way in this world the wicked are bound together in bundles but they are still in the field in the world and the righteous are also harvested they are bound together and they are left also in this field in this world until the day when the master will come to take the wheat to his garner it's interesting that in the early Christian church there were tares and the spirit of prophecy says that Christians should not be disheartened because they see tares in the church and the spirit of prophecy mentions Ananias, Sapphira, Simon Magus, Demas, Judas and all these tares had opportunity to be converted. They were given a chance to convert, to be converted to God. In other words, these tares, they had a chance to be transformed into wheat on page 75 Christ object lessons we read the Savior does not point forward to a time when all the tares become wheat some unconverted 
people may be converted. But Jesus pointed out that not all wicked will be converted. On page 122 of Christ Object Lessons, Christ Object Lessons, page 122 and 123, speaking about the parable of the net, it says, the casting of the net is the preaching of the gospel. This gathers both good and evil into the church. When the mission of the gospel is completed, the judgment will accomplish the work of separation. On page 123, both the parable of the tares and that of the net plainly teach that there is no time when all the wicked will turn to God. The wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. The good and the bad fish are together drawn ashore for a final separation. Again, these parables teach that there is to be no probation after the judgment. When the work of the gospel is completed, there immediately follows the separation between the good and the evil and the destiny of each class is forever fixed. The good and evil, good fish and bad fish, wheat and tares are gathered into this field, the church, and they grow together until the harvest. And when is the harvest? When will be the separation? It says here, when the work of the gospel is completed, before the close of probation, and when that separation takes place, the destiny of each class, of the wheat and of the tares, good fish and bad fish, false brethren and true brethren, they, their fate will be fixed forever. Therefore, applying the parable of the wheat and tares to the church as being the field and the harvest in the church being the end of the world is not a correct uh, explanation. The field being the world, the end of the world is the harvest. But if the church is a field, the harvest must be done when the fruit ripens. And the last chance is the time when just before probation closes. End of probationary time. But there is still another application of the parable of the wheat and tares. And we will read about this third application in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 113. And notice carefully how the Spirit of Prophecy puts here an other field. If faithfulness and vigilance had been preserved, if there had been no sleeping or negligence upon the part of any, the enemy would not have had so favorable an opportunity to sow tares among the wheat. Satan never sleeps. He is watching and he improves every opportunity to set his agents to scatter error which finds good soil in many 
unsanctified hearts. Here now we have another field, the heart. And in the heart, Satan sows error. Satan never sleeps. This error sowed in the heart represents the tares. And why does he sow tares in this field, in the heart? Because there is no watchfulness, vigilance, and because sometimes we sleep. And while man sleeps, the enemy sows the tares. In Christ Object Lessons, pages 37 and 38, we read this. The sower soweth the word. Christ came to sow the world with truth. Ever since the fall of man, Satan has been sowing the seeds of error. Ever since the fall of man, Christ had been the revealer of truth to the world. By him, the incorruptible seed, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, is communicated to men. In this field, which is the heart, the seed is sown. Jesus sows the word of truth, the word of God. Satan sows error. And the word of God is a wheat. Error is the tear. And the sowers are always the same. Christ sowing the wheat. Satan sowing the tares. In Christ Object Lessons, page 44, we read, The seed sown by the wayside represents the Word of God as it falls upon the heart of an inattentive hearer. Notice that here again, the Word of God is the wheat. And it, that Word of God sown may fall upon the heart of an inattentive hearer and that seed is taken up by the birds by the enemy taken out so in this other comparison of the parable the wheat again represents the word of God the truth the sower is Jesus Christ the field is the heart the tares represent error sowed by Satan in the heart now the question is how long should the tares and wheat remain in this field could we leave the wheat and tares in this field, the heart, until Jesus comes? If we do that, we are hopeless. If we permit that error, the tares should remain in this field, in the heart, until Jesus comes. We are lost. In Great Controversy, page 623, we read the following statement. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his Father's commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand 
in a time of trouble. Notice carefully that Satan could find nothing in the heart of Jesus. Jesus said, The prince of this world cometh and findeth nothing in me. John chapter 14 verse 30. Satan could find nothing in Jesus. And the spirit of prophecy says that those that would stand in a time of trouble, they will be in that same condition. No more tears. No sin in their hearts. They, their sins had to be blotted out before probation closes. Therefore, if someone will permit sin, which is there, to remain in this field in the heart until the coming of Jesus, he is hopeless, he is lost. Because when probation closes, Jesus will utter the following words. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. When probation closes, the destiny of each class is forever fixed. There will be no possibility of conversion after the close of probation. Therefore, every evil should be taken out from the heart before the close of probation. And what about in the church? Also in the church, the tears must be rooted out from the church before the close of probation. Because the harvest of the field, which is the church, is the end of probationary time. Many well-meaning brethren they believe that in the church sin may be tolerated because they say, well, Jesus said that the tear will be among the wheat in the field. It's true. But when we deal with sin and sinners in the church, we have to be very careful. You remember in the parable of the wheat and tares, the servants of the Lord, they were willing to root out the tares before time. And Jesus said, no, leave them to grow together. Why is it that we should be very careful about rooting out the tares? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 114. If persons are as deserving of being separated from the church as Satan was of being cast out of heaven, they will have sympathizers. There is always a class who are more influenced by individuals then they are by the Spirit of God and sound principles. And in their unconsecrated state, these are ever ready to take sides with the wrong and give their pity and sympathy to the very ones who least deserve it. These sympathizers have a powerful influence with others. Things are seen in a perverted light. Great harm is done, and many souls are ruined. 
when we suspect that a brother deserves to be separated from the church but we do not have evidence we have to be very careful not to root out because then the wheat may be rooted out also let me just tell you one of the experience that I had when I was working in one of the states in South America in Brazil I was transferred to a church and I found a brother there that he was teaching error but he was a man of pleasing address everybody loved him and I noticed that he was teaching error so I called the committee and I presented his case to the committee and I said brethren this brother is teaching error this is what he is teaching and I noticed that the members of the committee they were not prepared to take any action against him so I decided to wait patiently because if we root out a tear we may root out also a wheat so we waited patiently and in one month's time this very brother he separated himself from the church left the reform movement and joined the main Seventh-day Adventist Church but the first Sabbath that he went to the church in the morning in the afternoon he took all his fishing equipment and Sabbath afternoon he went fishing for fishing and when the members of the committee in our church found out that he is transgressing the Sabbath they insisted with me to call the committee together and so the committee proposed that he should be separated from the church but we had to wait until the fruit was ripened and one brother the treasurer of the church told me brother if you would take any action against this brother at that time when you call the committee together I would sympathize for him and would take side with him but now I see that the fruit is ripened and I'm the first to lift up my hand to separate him from the church so if there are souls that deserve to be separated from the church we should know that there will be always some who sympathize for persons not for principles and therefore we have to be very careful how to deal with sin and sinners in the church however we should not tolerate sin when one persists in open sin he must be separated from the church what will happen if an open sinner continues in the church and the leading brethren they tolerate him and they say well he is a tear let him grow together until the harvest what will happen this is what the spirit of prophecy says testimonies for the church volume 3 265 he God would teach his people 
that disobedience and sin are exceedingly offensive to him and are not to be lightly regarded. He shows us that when his people are found in sin, they should at once take decided measures to put that sin from them, that his frown may not rest upon them all. But if the sins of the people are passed over by those in responsible positions, his frown will be upon them, and the people of God, as a body, will be held responsible for those sins. In his dealings with his people in the past, the Lord shows the necessity of purifying the church from wrongs. One sinner may diffuse darkness that will exclude the light of God from the entire congregation. And on page 269, the same book, Testament for the Church, Volume 3, 269, I read, God holds His people as a body responsible for the sins existing in individuals among them. If the leaders of the church neglect to diligently search out the sins which bring the displeasure of God upon the body, they become responsible for these sins. According to what we have read, can we tolerate open sin in the church and excuse it, saying, oh, that is a tear, must grow together until Jesus comes? If the church tolerates open sinner, the church becomes responsible and guilty before God. Therefore, we have to understand that a parable is a comparison. And Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to many different things. In the parable we are studying, he compared the kingdom of God to the wheat and tares, the parable of the wheat and tares. And wherever that parable fits, it may be applied. And remember, if the world is the field, then the end of the world is the harvest. But if the church is the field, the harvest is before. The last chance of harvest in the church is end of probationary time. And if the field is the heart, then as soon as the error is manifested, it should be rooted out. Because if it's left there, then we are lost. May God help us all that we may understand the right setting of the parables of the parable of the wheat and tares. Amen. One sat alone beside the highway begging his eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. When Jesus comes the tempter's power is broken when Jesus comes the tears are wiped away he takes 